three different media related companies going at this opportunity in three different ways. So I'm gonna do what I often don't do, which I'm gonna let each of you very quickly tell us how you're going at this sports betting opportunity without using buzzwords like leading, premium, or I don't know, what's your favorite that we can't, you can't use today? Uh, largest. Largest, okay. <laughs> So, Erica, why, why, yeah, yeah, why don't you tell Great. us quickly how Barstool so is thinking I, about this? So, there's two ways Barstool really looks at the sports betting opportunity. One is that in the U.S., unlike in other markets, there's no uh, generational betting. Your grandfather wasn't a better, your uncle, it's not cultural, um, predominantly because it's been illegal. And it's not small, but it's certainly not mass. So, we will be the first generation of betting in the US. I think we'll, we, we will become uh, the most influential group of bettors in this country, and the influence will be driven by the type of content we create. So that's the first piece. The second piece is that there will be no one who will attack betting the way we will, which is in a way that's authentic, in a way that's relatable, in a way that's constant. So we you know, live stream 22 hours a week, we have seven podcasts that have betting incorporated into them. We're doing dozens of video series. So we will come at this the way we've come at everything, which is on a fan-to-fan -fan level and in a way that's content-driven. And you have a bet. You recently launched a, a betting property. A betting vertical, yep, called Barstool Bets. And that's free bet. That's You're not wagering money, but you can no, win money. No, it's a content platform. It's OTT, and we have a free-to-play app. We're a national brand. We you know, touch 88 million people every month. Not every single one of them lives in a state where mobile or retail betting is legal, yep. and they want to get into the game, and we will make that possible to do with us. Okay. DraftKings, yeah, that's you, Jason. So um, you have a separate betting app where people are betting money, correct? That's correct. And um, that approach versus a content approach for you guys, why did, why did that make sense? Uh, I mean, it was much uh, more of a natural evolution from what we were doing before in Daily Fantasy. Um, we've tried, but haven't you know, been able to grow with the success that Erica and Patrick have in the content space. We're working at it, but it's pretty small for us. But and I, I, sh I should say up front that you have a content deal with SB Nation, which is owned by Vox Media, which is my parent company. So thank you for, to Peter Kafka for giving me that. Uh, conflict to deal with up here. So I'm going to go extra hard on you. So you'll be, okay. No, I thought that meant you have to be nicer to me. Um, that would be a different publication. Ah, we'd be that, happy yeah. to partner with you instead. Okay, okay, <laughs> great. I'm also uh, cutting business deals, so great. Um, actually, that, the, the genesis of that was really that, you know, we felt like companies such mm -hmm. as Vox, such as Barstool, such as Action, you know, that's where they're investing. That's their business, and they know how to do it better than us. And we have so much opportunity with the sports betting and daily fantasy and other sorts of online gaming that are evolving in the U.S. that, you know, for us to really focus there made a lot of sense. And it was a much more natural extension to go into online sports betting uh, versus the content side of it from what we were doing previously. Because we weren't really specializing in fantasy content before we were specializing right. in the fantasy games. Got it. And Patrick, tell us just briefly about Action Network and the subscription media model. Yeah, we're, we're a, Action Network is a sports betting data information and insights platform. We make money one of two ways primarily, through subscription. So we have three tiers of subscription based on your experience as a better. I like to say there's a shallow end, a medium end, and a deep end of the pool. Deep end of the pool being a better who thinks like a, a hedge fund trader would trade and uses a Bloomberg type terminal. And we have tools, assets, insights, and information to inform that better. Or maybe you're net new to betting, betting's now legal, uh, sports betting in 11 states, and you want to be able to be more educated to have uh, some more intellectual thought on how to bet is, is really kind of what we do. And we think we're a great customer to drive customers to Jason. So we have an affiliate model as well. So if I can turn one of our users into a customer of DraftKings, that's a win for both of us. So I'm going to start. Um, thank you for those. You, there were only like six buzzwords between you, so that's pretty good. Um, I'm going to start with, with uh, like Catholic schoolboy Jason Del Rey, uh, which is you're, you're mixing, in many cases, mobile devices, which have some addictive qualities, right, with um, 
a behavior that is becoming legalized, but there, there is risk there. So I'm curious for each of you, like, how are you thinking about that risk? You know, DraftKings, when I go on pushing notifications at me, how, how are you balancing the opportunity with, like, p- potential either legal or other downside of playing in this space? And Erica, you're looking at me, so I'll just... Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think we probably have the least risk of the folks up here. We're not an operator. We don't take bets. Did you that know? play? A, does that play a role in your strategy? I or mean, no? anyone who's familiar with barstool sports would say that we're not well positioned to be an operator. I would say, like, we're, we're and they're missing. also not risk averse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, would have thought you're not well positioned I, I for a lot want, of things, yeah, but no, here you we're are. We're well so. positioned for a lot of things, uh, including time and people's feed. So, you know, our business is we want to create content that resonates. We want to take as much of your time as possible. We want to be as entertaining as possible. Certainly, we want to be responsible, which is something we think about in betting, and you'll see us do more of. Um, how, what is think, how does thinking about it manifest you know, itself? Don't drink and gamble. Gamble responsibly. Like, and we'll find a way to do that in a way that's funny and compelling. I think that's what's very different for, about us is we will be exceedingly creative about how we bring those messages to life in the same way that we're educating people how to bet, which is also equally as important. You know, to the Catholic schoolboy example, like betting can be daunting. It makes people feel stupid. There's a lot of numbers involved. Like, so how do you think about making a guy or a girl feel comfortable to do a prop bet or to become a more sophisticated better whereby someone like Patrick takes over. So that's how we think about it. Um, Jason, what, what about with DraftKings? Well, I think first thing people have to remember is there is a robust illegal betting market that already exists now, most of which uh, the activity of which is conducted on mobile phones. So um, already there uh, are hundreds of billions of dollars being bet in the U.S. each year, the vast majority of it via mobile devices. Um, I think the first point is how do you take that type of setup and do it in a way that is better? Um, and that really involves having the proper regulations. It involves having the right companies licensed. It involves having uh, transparency uh, around what the policies and around what the tools customers can use in the area of responsible gaming are. Um, The second piece is more internally how we look at it. We view this as a great responsibility. I grew up loving fantasy. Um, My parents were never into fantasy and betting. It was something my friends got me into. But, uh, you know, I thought it was something that was just really cool, and I always enjoyed it. And it never even occurred to me until later in life that there could be a downside to it. Uh, It was not something I thought about because it was just something I got so much enjoyment out of. And... I view this as an incredible opportunity and also an incredible responsibility. Uh, I have loved these things my whole life, and to be able to be a part of comp- a company that is bringing uh, those products uh, in a legal, regulated way to the United States is, um, I have to pinch myself, it's pretty yep. cool. And um, the last thing you know we would ever want to do is screw that up by messing up in this area. So we preach this day in and day out. We have a compliance team that has strict policies around responsible gaming. We have, very, uh, we, we have very robust trainings that we give to all employees who interact with customers, and it's something that we're continuously looking at and upgrading. And then, of course, we have tons of tools that we provide for customers, including the ability to limit their play, exclude themselves, and many other things. Um, I was just going to ask, I mean, sh- should I expect that responsibility to, transi- to translate into, you know, maybe like, oh, this is just one example, but... What- maybe a little lighter on, you know, notifications than, like, an app that doesn't play in the space. I mean, that doesn't seem like your company's style necessarily, but I'm, I guess I'm, I'm trying to just figure out how that actually shows well, up. Well, responsible responsibility gaming up. is much, it has to be much more individualized than that. You can't have a one-size-fits-all policy because the vast majority of people don't have issues uh, with those types of things. It's about identifying the customers that do and taking the appropriate action and also providing tools for them to self-identify. And then thirdly, it's about working with the states and the industry to create global frameworks and master lists. Each state has a list where, you know, because you don't want to create a disincentive. I don't want to sell, put somebody on the negative list and they're just going to go to my competitors, yep. right? So each state has a master list of people that are excluded from gaming and everyone 
And it's also not just the online sports betting stuff, it's the casinos, if they have brick and mortar casinos, it's everything. I wanna get it to a point where the states are actually sharing those amongst each other. There's a lot of issues, of course, as you know, with interstate sharing of those types of things and pharma and lots of other areas. But I think that this is something that we can be a big part of and I, I really think it's an important, not just important, a critical piece to making this happen in the right way. So one of the um, challenges right now, I assume, in this space is the state-by-state -state legalization. Um, you guys probably know the numbers better than I do, but nine states with some form of legalization, less than that where mobile sports betting is legal and allowed. How are you, like, how do you successfully and affordably acquire customers in a dynamic like this where I'm assuming, you, you know, targeting, you know, it's hard to target just um, New Jersey sports bettors with sort of a, a marketing campaign that makes makes sense and is at scale. So looking for any insight into yeah. how you're acquiring customers today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like any content business, Google's your front door. So uh, SEO is still incredibly meaningful in this category every day. People are doing searches for Eagles Patriots odds. That was an unfortunate game for me, but anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those kind of searches are happening at scale in mass, and they're happening with more frequency as more and more states are, are legal. We have 11 this year, four mobile, and they're in big markets. You know, when you look at sort of the data in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, I think New Pennsylvania's handle is $250 million in month one. Uh, New Jersey's now $450 million. And, and for people who aren't familiar, handle meaning? The amount wagered in that, in that, in that market. And 80% of betting in New Jersey is mobile, which is... For this business to succeed and for all of our businesses to succeed in the future, it needs to be mobile, it needs to be legal, and it needs to be responsible. So, you know, the gating factors are interesting here. I mean, I think I saw some data that like 40% of the bets in New Jersey with, are within two miles of the border. Why is that? New York's a pretty big market. New York could come online next year, which is going to be pretty huge. That market is very large. So again, so, Goog so you're saying I think Google, Google, Google old school Google SEO, old right? still Google, but we still will cry our customers in Facebook and and uh, Instagram. We were just approved to start doing SEM in New Jersey with Google, which is a, a really big opportunity. I think Twitter has probably a little different of an outlook on sports betting content, which is what? which they're not really allowing it. Um, so I think that's a little short-sighted. We think it'll change over time, but it's you know kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat and acquiring customers and making sure you have the right CAC and LTV because we are a subscription business and we're able to get a better sense of that. I think brand will matter significantly. Like when you look at, if you live in a state where there's legal betting, if I, I remember watching the Duke game during March Madness and I was hit with four ads from betting operators that all looked very similar. There's a very alpha message. They're screaming the bet at you. Like, trust is going to matter. You're ultimately asking someone to put money with you and have the potential to lose money with you. So brand is also going to be a massive differentiator. One, in driving trust, and two, in driving affinity. And if you can create that trust and affinity, you have the highest chance of repeat loyalty. If you look at DraftKings and FanDuel, they are dominating New Jersey because they have invested millions and millions and millions of dollars in brand in a way that the rest of the field has yet to do and probably can't afford to do. So I think that, you know, certainly smart marketing tactics will make a difference, but so will brand. And Jason, how New Jersey sports betting, you know, Still relatively young, but um, for states, it's it's one of the oldest now. How big of, of a business is that for you already? It's a significant portion of, of your overall revenue? Uh, it's definitely become significant for sure. And, um, you know, we don't disclose specific numbers on that, so I can't give you any numbers, but it's certainly become a very important part of our business in a very short period of time. And... Um, when you think about marketing in, you know, specifically for the sports betting app versus the daily fantasy, um, how do you think about that breakdown and where you're gonna, where you're leaning in both geographically and sort of, sort of platform wise as well? Well, you know, geographically, definitely in the states that have, in the states that have legalized and we are live with a sports betting product, we're primarily uh, promoting the sports betting product. Um, everywhere else, it's daily fantasy sports. So that's kind of the, the high level of the strategy. 
Um, we've been marketing daily fantasy for a long, long time. Uh, I think by now, if you are somebody interested in that, you've probably heard of us. So um, we think the most important thing is to get the message out in individual states that we have sports betting. And what's really interesting about the marketing side is, you know, right when the PASPA ban got overturn uh, overturned uh, by, by the Supreme Court, I think there were a lot of people who were like, oh, sports betting's legal everywhere, great. And there's actually an education now when it comes to each state, like your state's legal now. And then you have states like Pennsylvania where even though you can hyper-target on places like Google, when you're buying uh, broadcast media, you buy DMAs. And so uh, Philadelphia shares a DMA with uh, South Jersey. Yep. So we've been buying in that DMA for a while. So there's people who've been seeing ads and probably tried to use DraftKings, like, oh, it doesn't work in my state. So now we got to figure out how to get the message to them of, no, it works now in your state. You can do it now in Pennsylvania. Sounds like not ideal. Whole different way. marketing challenge. Yeah. It's not just, I mean, the brand is built. Erica's right now. It's about educating people about what products we have available and what geographies. What are the leagues telling you about how they want to play in this if you're having conversations with leagues? Not having conversations. Not having conversations with leagues, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think they've been pretty transparent publicly. They've, uh, you know, a couple of them have done these AGO deals with us, so we're very excited to be partnering with them. Um, you know, Can I don't you really know much. Can just briefly explain what, what, what those are for people who don't uh, AGO stands for Authorized Gaming Operator. Um, basically, it's a deal that you would strike with a league. Uh, several edition, we're not the only ones have this, not an exclusive deal whereby um, you know, they've kind of given you their stamp of approval and allowed you to use some of their IP and the product and some other things in exchange for a deal that you do with them. The fights with the, le the leagues will become interesting in how they think about their data and how they think about incremental monetization and yeah. control of that data, which I think is going to become paramount in the next like 24 to 48 months. The other thing that will happen with the they want They want to get paid. They want to get paid. Yeah. It's, they view it as their product and their data. The other thing that's interesting where you know, we feel strongly about is if you're a media company and you have a league rights deal, it influences how you talk about that league. It influences your content. It influences your ad strategy. It influences your tone and topic around betting. By virtue of us not having formal league relationship, it enables us to talk about betting the way a better would talk about betting, right? When Todd Gurley blows a lead and you know it's the over, the under, whatever yep. it may be, we're gonna talk about that like you've got money on the line. If you're a national outlet that has an NFL deal, you are not talking about it that way. So I, I also think that's going to create some dividing lines around how media companies cover sports by virtue of what their formal relationship is, either on the data side or on the right side. Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're all about manual extraction of, of dollar value if you're a rights holder. Um, but there has not been a multi-billion dollar opportunity in sports since the dawn of the internet. So they all know they're going to play. We've spent time with every single one of them. Um, I would say the NBA is a real leader, I think has been, you know, has, has done some smart things, has been interesting. PGA Tour is an interesting league that people probably wouldn't think a ton about with regard to betting. And then someone like NASCAR. Mm -hmm. NASCAR wants to raise the level of their sport in the conversation around betting. And what do they all care about? They want to increase gate revenue and they want to increase rights revenue. So rights revenue, gates revenue, merchandising revenue, these things grow kind of with GDP, 3% a year but gambling is purported to grow rights by 13, 14, 17% a year. So, it's, so how it's do they actually do that? So how do they do that either through you or other partners? I mean, you know, a lot of it is they all have destinations. All these leagues are increasingly media businesses themselves. So they come to us and ask for content. You know, there's not the, an assumption that just because you're in the business of creating content, you can create good sports betting content. It's a very different lens. It's a very different data-driven kind of analytical experience. So. We work with NASCAR, we work with the PGA Tour, NBA, all the different leagues that want information and data and odds as well. So it you, go ahead. It go will ahead. also change engagement. Like Jason and DraftKings call it the game within the game. Like if you look at Major League Baseball, it is very hard to get a 20, 20 year old, 22 year old to care about Major League Baseball. Very long season, very long game, very slow pace. Great sport to bet on. So many opportunities to bet. So the engagement, the bet has to be to get younger audiences to leverage betting as a way to create more affinity and engagement for the sport itself. Like that's where I think the leagues will see incredible benefit beyond short-term monetization and obviously content. It will be engagement with younger audiences. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right on that. I don't, 
everybody wants to get paid, but I don't think it's just that they want to get paid. Totally. I think it's way bigger than that. This isn't, you know, a beer company that's going to pay them some ad dollars or something like that. This is actually core to how fans are experiencing their product. And they know that, for example, certain younger generations, certain sports, this can be a way to reach them that they wouldn't otherwise. They also know that there's a tremendous amount of value in understanding insights from where people are betting, um, you know, what kind of data uh, we might have that might tell them what types of uh, things that their customers would be interested in. Those are all things that can generate value way outside. And then you also have the simple fact that if people are playing fantasy and betting, they're consuming more content. Mm -hmm. Most people watch sports for one reason. They watch because they want to care about the result on the field. Some people like the athletic prowess, all that, but most people watch because they have a rooting interest. Usually it's their hometown team or something like that. Uh, Erica once yelled at me because I switched to the Patriots as my hometown team after many, many years. So, you know, there's deep-rooted things. From, uh, and from Patriots. Uh, I, was, I grew up in Miami, and, um, you know, it's different down there. If you you're know. a Dolphins fan, you would switch to a Patriots yeah. fan. I would never switch to a Patriots fan. I know, I know. But you've endured the last, like, 30 years with me, so you understand. You ha you'll come to the Patriots one day. I know. But anyway, um, you know, I think that the important thing is, like, you watch the Dolphins I, because you care about the team. All the other games you may not care about. So what fantasy does, what betting does, is it makes you care about the game. And at the core, it's the same reason you're watching in the first place. People are watching because they want to root for an outcome. They want the suspense of seeing if that outcome happens. Those are the reasons people watch. And this is just magnifying that and layering it across everything instead of just making it, you know, my favorite player, my favorite team, something like that. What I, want to, I want to say one thing that might be a little contrary on the, on the notion of brand. I think brand is incredibly important, and especially in categories where you're giving people money. But remember, sophisticated bettors are going to want the best odds. Mm -hmm. And they like the user so is experience. That, so is that what you do? I mean, not necessarily what we do, but we present information and data and odds in, a, in, a, in an experience where you can decision on where to bet. But I think that in the ability and the desire to acquire customers, someone might offer a different odd than another book because they're going to want that, that user. And that's going to be incredibly important as well. So uh, line shopping is something that sophisticated bettors do. So brand is important, but odds are incredibly important when they bet. I have two more questions, and then we'll take some audience questions. Um, what do the tech giants want in this space? Can you, I mean, Apple, Amazon, you know, we talked a little bit about Twitter sort of um, not being as aggressive or not being aggressive at all as you would like them. Um, I'm curious, let's start, let's start with the sort of app store players. What, what is that? Is that a hurdle or a tough process to get these apps approved still, or is that all? Is that all done? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering if these guys want, they want a their cut, cut of this. They want their pound of flesh. You know what I mean? If you want, you know, Facebook would like me to not post organic ads or organic content about betting. They would like me to buy sponsored content about betting so that they can make money on it. I think the case by case in the app store. So what happens with that? You, so I still you, do the organic. Right. <laughs> um, until get the dial gets turned. Yeah, until which point? Until the dial gets turned, which is true, you know, with anything. Yeah. Um, in terms of the app store, I mean, we've struggled far more with Google in launching Barstool Bets, which is a content and free-to-play game. We struggled far more with Google than we did with Apple. So it's what does know, that mean actually? Just the process is longer. The process is longer. The approval is more difficult. The bearing on your other apps and services is more significant. So you know, my experience is that it's a constantly shifting landscape of self-interest by the platforms. Some are more lenient now. Some will be more lenient later. Some are woke to it now. Some will be woke to it later. I think if you're a brand and a platform, you've got to find your owned and operated way and whatever means it takes to, to find and create that, and then you evaluate it constantly and shift over time. Yeah, we're, we're a subscription app, so I pay a tariff to Apple and to Google Play Store every month. It's not fun. I was going to say, happy to? No, not happy I to. I mean, we're happy to acquire customers. I'd rather you sign up to be a subscriber for the Action Network on the web um, and uh, I'm able to generate. Are you, are you allowed to say that, or are you so, going to get slapped I just did right say now? That. I just did say that. I'd see someone right there. They're coming um, up with the ruler. I think, uh, I think somebody's going to come in black coats and take you away. That's afterwards. okay. That's okay. But they're great partners, and we distribute through them. And that's a place where a lot of customers and consumers are going to come to, you know, to to download our app and to engage in an experience. It's a pretty seamless credit card experience. But you know, it's 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 a tension that's that's a concern for I think any brand, and we want to work as closely as we can for the right outcomes. Um, Erica, I have one or two questions for mm -hmm. you, and then 
Uh, anyone who has questions, please go to one of the mics, including that one I can barely see up there. Um, news reports recently, Barstool, uh, talking to potential acquirers, I've been told this isn't your run of the mill, every media company is for sale, this is an actual process. Mm -hmm. um, what are the chances that six months from now, Barstool is an independent company and not owned by someone else? I mean, I was hoping that Jason would have a check today, but. Well, I mean, <laughs> this marriage, I mean, this would make sense. Have you, have you guys discussed a potential deal? No, your look, companies? Uh, look, like we work with you know, most every single betting company. Um, you know, to my point about brand, what we have that is defining is a brand that stands for something in this space and a very large audience. So we talk to everyone. We work very closely with FanDuel. We're working with MGM. We work with PointsBet. So I don't know what the future will hold for us. What I'm focused on is building the definitive brand in the space for a young mobile and social audience. Uh, and that's what we'll keep doing. Have your two companies had acquisition talks? I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to talk mm. about that here, sorry. I don't know, we're, we're this is Our lot. policy is generally not to comment on stages at conferences about this thing, <laughs> especially when you're sitting right next to the person. Maybe if she weren't here, I could tell you. But. Okay, Patrick, what do you think? I, I just met these people today. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any audience questions? No? I think they would love audience questions, but I'll just keep going because, um, oh, here we go. Just tell, tell us who you are. Uh, so I'm Jonathan, I work for EA Games. Um, I'm not much of a gambler myself, but my interest clearly is video games. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are moving outside of traditional sports into the state of esports and where your businesses can fit into that genre. So we, you know, what I believe personally is that betting, while it may be very vertically focused right now, hardcore bettors, people who understand betting, people who are interested in mass traditional sports in the U.S., it will expand. So if you look at, I think women are a huge target. If you think about prop bets around the Super Bowl, if you look at betting entertainment, you know, Patrick and I sat together last week, you know, J Justin Bieber, Haley Baldwin. Like, are they gonna make it or are they not? Can you bet on that? Vanderpump for me. Vanderpump, yeah. sure. Anything yeah. is bettable. Yeah. You know, we've played with esports. Esports is a world that you have to have, you have to know it, you can't fake it to be in it. And we've tried to be really thoughtful about that. We have a really bad gamer named Smitty. <laughs> um, and his shtick is that he just basically sucks. So we're working on that. But um, I think it will be infinitely bettable and infinitely compelling, especially as you look at, you know, eight to 16 year olds and what they're watching. They're watching people stream gaming. And when they become of a betting age, that will be a definitive and defining platform of sports for them. Yeah, t teams, leagues, publishers like Activision, we know it's a huge market, big opportunity. Um, EA, obviously, as well. Uh, we've created content for esports. We haven't seen as much success as some of the bigger bat and ball sports that people are typically betting in because we have a product where you actually track your bets in our platform and you're able to see how frequently people bet on football, baseball, basketball, tennis, golf, et cetera. And esports is, is just a hard one, but we know it's going to be a big business and we're going to hang around the rim or hang around the joystick or however you'd kind of think about that. But I think another concern around is integrity, is you know, integrity issues in sport. Gambling certainly helps. Hopefully it'll help in esports, which is a hard category to, to really influence integrity. Integrity, how? Meaning are people blowing games on purpose? Like yeah. are they throwing games? Like how, how, how can you easy can, can, uh, can you control the outcome? Are the odds correct? Those kinds of things, it's so nascent. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'll, I'll finish up with one more. Um, big media companies have, uh, with the exception of Fox, right? With Fox has a betting, new betting service, Fox Bets. Um, some of the others haven't made such a bold step like that. Um, who do you think is next among the big media companies to get involved, and how would they do that? Bonus points if it's, well, you're not getting acquired by a media company, but um, maybe you. Go ahead. I think that you're, you're the media person, so. I think that... Patrick, you were talking about being down in Bristol, too, so we can get to Yeah, that. look, like, I, I think the one, if you think about nine states, like, nine states does not a nation make. It is, this is a patchwork quilt of varying regulations, tax structures, rules, 
it's hard for a media company and a traditional broadcast media company to say, yep, I'm all in on betting from an audience perspective, from an advertiser perspective and a monetization perspective for something that's not national. So I, I, think by, I think Fox has absolutely been a leader in the space. I think the others are figuring it out. The lack of a national rollout has made that difficult. I also think that there is, I think they, will, they are approaching it from a very formulaic, in a very formulaic way whereby you have three people behind a desk. Like, one is a very pretty girl, one is a person of color, and then you got two white guys, and they're talking about betting the same way they've talked about sports forever, and I'm not sure that's gonna play over time. I don't think that resonates with a current better, per se, and it definitely doesn't resonate with a future better. So I think the media companies are figuring it out and will figure it out. I think it's just a question of when and how, and, and those answers will be nuanced based on the regional footprint and based on the rollout of betting itself. Yeah, I mean, I was, the, the regional part is, is an important one. I think the Sinclair is going to be a big player yep. here, owning those RSNs. I think NBC Comcast is yep. going to be a big player. Haven't really shared their cards too much. But if you're a diversified media company and you don't have a gambling strategy, you're, you're completely myopic. It's just a unequivocal multi-billion dollar opportunity. They need to figure this out. And uh, we, we've met with all of them and seen varying degrees of enthusiasm in the category. But they'll all get there. It's just a matter of time. I think they're also waiting for a check which is also driving it. It's like they coming, want not, their pound of flesh from not the coming from you, Not coming, not from, coming from us, no. Multiple checks were waiting for Jason, so maybe we'll end that way. <laughs> Thank you very much, the panel. Thank you. Thank you.